The Regional Approaches to Climate Change for Pacific Northwest Agriculture Project, or REACH, we're interested in all the dimensions of the cereal cropping systems, understanding them in the context of how they might respond to climates as climate change in the region. So as an entomologist, and uh, I'm certainly interested in that, and we're interested in thinking about those insects that might be influenced by climate change in the project. The project also includes weed scientists and pathologists and agronomists and social scientists and economists. But today I'm just going to talk about a couple of insects that, uh, insect groups that potentially are affected by climate change. One of those is aphids. In the Northwest and cereal production systems, we have 13 aphid species. Some of those are quite rare. Some of them, five or six of them, are abundant enough so that they pretty much can be found anywhere we look in any season. So the big ones are the Russian wheat aphid, the English grain aphid, the bird cherry oat aphid, the green bug, and the rose grass aphid. All those aphids can be direct pests of cereal crops by feeding on the plants and reducing their photosynthate. Uh, the aphids act as sinks and just pull the phloem out of the plants and, and injure them. They can also injure the plants uh, by injecting toxins that causes the plant to grow strangely or produce uh, injurious colored spots on the plant that, that are no longer useful for the plant for photosynthesis. And finally, they can vector viruses, uh, especially the cereal yellow dwarf virus or barley yellow dwarf virus complex into the, into the plants. So producers in the region need to be concerned about those and know the difference between them. The Russian wheat aphid, for example, is not a vector of the viruses, but causes serious injury uh, to the plant because uh, of the toxins that it ingests into the plant tissue. Whereas bird cherry oat aphid doesn't injure the plant very much uh, compared to Russian wheat aphid, but is the best vector of the barley yellow dwarf virus, so poses a different threat and challenge. This is bird cherry oat aphid, Ropalsiphum padi. Uh, it's the only one that's on our cereals in this part of the world that is dark like this. So it's distinct from the others because of its olive color. It tends to feed low down on the plant and it's the best vector among those in the region of the virus, barley yellow dwarf virus. In the REACH project we have discovered that another aphid has invaded the region in the last three or four years, Metapolophium festuque cerealium. Uh, we call that MFC for short because we need some kind of a short name for it and we don't have a common name for it. So we're interested in uh, climate change effects on aphids because every year uh, aphids recolonize the Palouse region from other areas and uh, they come on prevailing winds and their abundance is to some degree affected by temperatures and wind direction. Uh, these are phenological figures that, that show the time of arrival through the season of two different aphid species at five different locations around the region. And what, one of the th important patterns here is that we can see that frequently aphids arrive in large numbers in the fall. There's a fall flight. That fall flight can bring aphids into contact with the fall planted wheat and possibly the timing of that affects the level of injury and the probability that the aphids can uh, carry uh, the virus to the crop. In the REACH project, we've been tracking this and we intend to continue to do so, so that we can get baselines and look at the patterns as they uh, change in climate and temperature. So we can do some projections about aphid and aphid risk and the risk of aphid injury in future years. I'm also interested are we in the REACH project are interested in another pest that affects cereals, the cereal leaf beetle. It's relatively new to the northwest that arrived in the late 90s and spread across Washington state. It's in most of the or all I think of the cereal production counties. It threatened to become a, quite a serious pest here but is currently well controlled it apparently by Terasticus julis, which is a small parasitic wasp that attacks the larvae of this beetle. Otherwise, the beetle feeds on the leaves of the wheat plant, and the larvae also feed on the leaves. And if they feed heavily on the 
what's called the flag leaf, which is the leaf right adjacent to the stem that produces the, the grain head, then there can be serious reductions in yield. And this plant was just put in here yesterday with these beetles, so this is all the damage they can do in a day. So you can see that in a relatively short time, if your population was this dense, uh, this plant would be consumed. So at this point, uh, our best estimate for a threshold for cereal leaf beetle is one per plant after booting. So when you have the head forming, if you have one uh, adult or larva on the flag leaf here, you should typically a producer would want to treat uh, to reduce the population. I also have an example of a larva because when they go through their four, inst four instars, they finally become this stage and then pupate in the soil. And this also shows some extensive damage caused by that larva. So finally, uh, when farmers sample for cereal leaf beetle, uh, they have to be aware of the possibility that they could mistake uh, this insect for a cereal leaf beetle. And this is actually not a cereal leaf beetle. This is called a colops beetle uh, in the family Meliridae. And these guys are predators, so they're actually beneficials. They feed on aphids. They may even feed on the eggs of cereal leaf beetle if they encounter them, but they look very much like them. They are also about the same size. They have metallic purple uh, elytra, the, the leaf, the wing covers, similar to the cereal leaf beetle, and uh, they have some reddish parts of their bodies, so they look pretty similar. They look different because their wing covers are slightly shorter, and the males have unusually shaped antennae with knobs on them about halfway out, whereas cereal leaf beetle antennae are long, filamentous the whole length. And they act differently because they're predators, and you can see them when you find them in the field. They're foraging actively, looking for prey, whereas the cereal leaf beetle are mostly um, staying put on the leaf they're feeding on. They don't need to go anywhere to get a meal.